This segment of WGCU's Local Untold Stories is underwritten by Lee County Government County Commission, Fort Myers Toyota, and Lee Tran. Steamers and schooners, the iron horse, the horseless carriage, barnstormers and bombardiers, all figured into the early history of transportation in Southwest Florida. For thousands of years, getting around Southwest Florida was all about the water. Native Calusa Indians traversed coastal waters with trade routes into the Caribbean and penetrated the dense inlands through an intricate, hand-dug canal system. During rainy season, they even crossed overland to the Atlantic in their archaic dugout canoes. In the early 1500s, maritime activity entered a new era as European explorers sailed galleons into the area. In 1824, a U.S. government schooner discovered such a fishery at Punta Rasa, at the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River, while on a mission to discount rumors that the area was being used as a hideout for Caribbean pirates. During the Civil War, large squadrons of gunboats and sloops patrolled southwest Florida waters to intercede blockade runners. After the war, the burgeoning cattle trade further expanded boat traffic to Havana markets as Punta Rasa became a major port and a known stop between New Orleans and Key West. Water traffic uh, down to Key West was essential as well because uh, that was the county seat until the middle 1870s. And if you had to record a deed or uh, if you were getting married, uh, you had to record your licensing, uh, that sort of thing. In Key West, that's where the census uh, was connected as well. And uh, to go to Key West, uh, there were a number of vessels, both sailing and steam vessels, that would go down there and then you'd connect to other ports. After the Civil War, steamers brought homesteaders, often from other ports, plus clever businessmen and wealthy tourists from the Northeast to Southwest Florida. In the 1880s, the discovery of phosphate up the Peace River positioned the deep water port of Boca Grande for a world-renowned future. In his memoirs, Captain Kerry Johnson writes, with phosphate, a valuable mineral for fertilizers and hundreds of other products coming in great demand all over the world, our deep water pass and harbor became important. By 1889, large four-masted square-rigged sailing vessels as well as steamships anchored in the harbor. Cargoes of phosphate were loaded from barges. They were bound for ports all over the world. By the turn of the 20th century, steamers ruled the coastline and remained the only real connection with the outside world for much of Southwest Florida. The outer islands, including Sanibel and Captiva, were highly dependent on their service. They carried mail, they carried supplies for the homesteaders, they carried lumber to build their houses. Um, People, every once in a while, they'd carry cars um, and drop them off, or they would take um, the farming um, produce back into town. Um, after the railroad came to Fort Myers, it would go into the docks at, at Fort Myers and then be loaded on the train cars and heading on up north. So it was a two-way street. By the 1920s, at the height of Florida's early land boom, the demand for boat service reached its zenith. 
By the end of the decade, the Collier Line, owned by the highly influential Baron Collier, linked the southwest Florida ports of Punta Gorda, Boquilla, Yusepa, Captiva, Sanibel, St. James City, Fort Myers, Collier City, and Everglades. Overnight runs from Fort Myers to Tampa were also popular, with a promise of a restful night at sea. In 1928, the same year the Tamiami Trail made Southwest Florida more accessible for overland travel by car, the Kinsey brothers began what would become a thriving business for nearly 35 years. They started the car ferry service to Sanibel. The waterways, both coastal and inland, would remain an important aspect of transportation in Florida, but by the early 1890s were increasingly challenged by the railway. While the first tracks were laid in Florida in 1834, it would be another 52 years before the first steam engine blew into Punta Gorda at the upper reaches of southwest Florida, and nearly 93 years before the railways would reach Naples. Across the U.S., the railroads were thriving in the 1800s. The people of southwest Florida desperately wanted railroads to be a part of all that, but a sparse population meant passenger service wouldn't pay and a viable freight market had to be proven. The railroads were built into southwest Florida to handle commercial products such as the outbound timber, which was cut commercially, uh, southern yellow pine as an example, uh, cypress logs as an example, uh, pine stumps which go into production of dynamite as an example, uh, outbound limestone rock uh, which went through a variety of places throughout uh, Florida. Uh, agricultural products, things of this nature are what brought the railroads into the area. The railroad promoters envisioned lines that would connect to ships bound out of southwest Florida for New Orleans, Mobile, Key West, the West Indies, and even South America. The Florida legislature showed its support for such an enterprise as it awarded railroad magnate Henry Plant of the Florida Southern Railway some two and a half million acres in a land grant the biggest gift ever to a railroad company in Florida. As 1,500 laborers got to work in May 1885 grading the line, constructing bridges and laying track, speculation simmered over where the line would actually terminate. While the Charlotte Harbor area was expected to be the end of the line, rumors also circulated that Boca Grande, Pine Island, Fort Myers, Punta Rossa, and even Marco Island would be the terminus. In March of 1886, the Florida Southern opened the line from Bartow to Arcadia. Soon after, Isaac Trebu, who owned a considerable amount of land on the southern side of Charlotte Harbor, successfully outdid others in southwest Florida by apparently offering sufficient inducement for the railway to choose his hamlet of Trebu for its terminus. One year later, the town would change its name to Punta Gorda. Floridians living south of Punta Gorda were miffed as they waited and waited for the Iron Horse. A correspondent for the Fort Myers News summed up the waiting. No train to Fort Ogden yet, still in Arcadia, cause unknown. We're now having transportation by schooners as of old. There's a dead dog under the house as regards the railroad movement. In 1896, Henry Plant suggested that if Lee County were to provide an inducement of $40,000, the line might extend southward. However, the up-and-coming county couldn't rally such a sum. After Plant's death in 1899, Fort Myers banker Walter Langford began courting the Atlantic coastline, which had purchased Plant's Florida Southern. By 1903, his persistence paid off as construction of the line from Punta Gorda to Fort Myers got underway. Railroad directors agreed to fund the venture on the condition that Fort Myers provide a right-of-way and a depot site. In February 1904, several ecstatic residents of Fort Myers actually crawled up into the engine and pulled the bell rope and whistle cord after the first train pulled into the depot at Monroe Street. As the last spike was hammered into place by Mrs. James Hendry, Church bells rang, boat whistles blew, the crowd cheered, and a cannon fired. At that time, extension south of Fort Myers wasn't a viable prospect. 
there was very little commercial activity south of Fort Myers. Uh, the city, at the time the railroad arrived, really only extended about as far south as what is now Edison Street and hardly to what is today Hanson. Uh, it was virgin territory and was nothing but uh, fields and, and commercial garden areas. As it did for the waterways, the land boom of the 1920s would give cause for more transportation needs by rail. During that time, both the Atlantic coastline and the seaboard airline would lay track, at times side by side and crisscrossing in southwest Florida. Competition revealed the wealth of outgoing resources. From the cattle docks at Punta Rossa, through South Fort Myers out to LaBelle, with stops in Buckingham and Alva, the railroads proliferated and eventually moved south. After encountering alligators, muck, and mess, the Seaboard Airlines construction of the railway through Estero to Naples was finally completed in 1926. In January 1927, Seaboard Airline President S. Davies Warfield, who envisioned Naples as the future Miami of the West Coast, brought an entourage of 600 industry leaders along on cars from the famed Orange Blossom Special as it made the first celebratory run on the Fort Myers Naples Extension. That's the Orange Blossom Special. Ooh. I'm gonna bring my baby back. As the train pulled into Naples, the crowds roared, bands played, and flags waved. Progress had penetrated nearly all of Southwest Florida, with tracks soon to follow to Immokalee, Everglades City, and even Marco Island. While the railways would continue to be important to freight travel in Southwest Florida, they would slowly cease to serve passengers during the 1950s and 1960s. Then, tracks would gradually be removed from many extensions altogether, ceasing to exist by 1971. The golden age of the railroad here had come and gone within several decades as the roadways took over as the predominant mode of transportation. The early settlers who came by schooners and sloops pitched their tents on sugary white beaches. Those who came by land, however, endured inhospitable trails of muck and mire. Some came like the oft-imagined pioneers in huge covered wagons pulled by oxen or mules. The difficult terrain consisting of narrow, deeply rutted trails and at times waist-deep water refrained movement to just a few miles a day. It took time. As one homesteader said in uh, the late 1800s that you could go from Punta Gorda to Fort Myers, it was only 25 miles, or you could go by water and it was 75 miles, but to go by land was anywhere from rough to impossible. And of course, you could not bring too much in the way of supplies with you. In 1866, when Punta Rossa was eyed as a major cattle loading port, Jacob Summerlin, one of the top cattle owners in the state, had to build a causeway through the low-lying, mucky coastal swamp to connect the peninsula with the mainland. Southwest Florida settlers got around town by ox carts as well as horse and buggy through the turn of the 20th century when the first horseless carriage came onto the scene. Stretches of corduroy road where logs were laid crosswise on deep ruts were what was known as road improvement at that time. Talk of connecting the region with a highway was rampant, but its location was debated, not to mention its engineering and cost some wanted a coastal road from Punta Gorda, crossing the Caloosahatchee River to Fort Myers. Others were in favor of the Dixie Highway from Arcadia across the river at Olga, then proceeding eastward through Alva and LaBelle, and eventually crossing the state south of Lake Okeechobee. In 1914, the bridge at Olga won out, and Lee County Commissioners put forth nearly $10,000. The bridge opened in February 1915, Nevertheless, talk of a coastal route in the region continued. Just a few months later, voters approved a $177,500 bond issue to build a nine-foot hard-surfaced road from Fort Myers to Naples. In 1917, 
L.P. Dickey, secretary of the Tampa Board of Trade, coined the classic name, the Tamiami Trail, for the much sought after coastal route that would ultimately connect Tampa with Miami. Both Tampa and Miami were ready to build, but the stretch across Southwest Florida wasn't such a sure bet. South of Tampa, construction of the Tamiami Trail steadily advanced in the 1920s. At the same time, it became evident that crossing the Everglades was going to be a much more challenging engineering feat than anyone had realized. In April of 1923, a motorcade of 10 cars with men from all over Southwest Florida took off on an expedition to raise funds for further construction of the roadway from Punta Gorda south to Fort Myers and from Naples to Miami. Their trip would make international news and forever label them as the Tamiami Trailblazers. They put together what really amounted to a great publicity scheme and uh, they get 23 volunteers and uh, they gathered up uh, 10 automobiles and they decided that they were going to cross from Fort Myers all the way over to Dade County near Miami uh, and without the roads. And they had gathered up enough supplies for three days to take them across. Since it was the dry season, the trailblazers didn't think the crossing would prove too difficult. Plus, they had two Native American guides. The depths of the Everglades, however, would prove to be exceptionally challenging for the motorcade. A week went by and nobody heard from them. They were um, getting rather concerned. Miami didn't hear anything from them. Then another week went by and they started sending up airplanes. And they had airplanes um, trying to locate them in the Everglades, which was rather difficult. Meanwhile, their food had run out and they had to live on the land. So they started shooting deer. When a plane did finally spot them, it dropped supplies, foodstuffs, and one bottle of whiskey for the 23 men. Enough booze to revive in the throes of prohibition, but not knock them out. 23 days since they set out, to the worldwide attention of more than 35,000 inches of newspaper copy and countless radio reports, all of the men emerged weary and wet from the swamp. Of the 10 automobiles they started out with, two luxurious um, touring cars and eight Model Ts, uh, the two touring cars never made it. The one Model T got mired down in the mud and had to be abandoned, but seven of the eight Model Ts made it. At about the same time, Baron Collier succeeded in getting the legislature to break out a southern portion of Lee County to become Collier County. The name change in his honor was largely based upon the wealthy businessman's promise to promote and help fund the Tamiami Trail through Collier County. Finally, in April 1928, the link was complete. Tampa and Miami were engaged at the overall cost of $9 million. Southwest Floridians celebrated in full force. Now they were connected to the rest of the world by car. It would take airplanes to rival the influx of people and freight on the roadways. During both World War I and II, the growth of aviation in the Sunshine State was fueled by the military, both U.S. and British. Only Arizona had more flying days than Florida. Fields to train pilots for World War I brought some of the first flyers to the area. Both Door and Karlstrom Fields opened near Arcadia in 1917. In the war, however, would interrupt the immediate future of the improved landing area. In February 1942, the Fort Myers Airport had already earned the nickname Palmetto Field, as the Army Air Corps leased it from Lee County as a base. The first unit to use the base was the 98th Bombardment Group and its B-24s. In May 1942, the airfield was officially named Page Field by the Lee County Commission. Meanwhile, the airfields near Arcadia, Door, and Karlstrom Fields were back in business. For this war, Karlstrom would actually be a training field for more than 8,000 British Royal Air Force pilots. In Clewiston, Riddle Field trained some 2,500 RAF pilots. Later, that location would become a state airport. 
Training fields for U.S. pilots were also established in Punta Gorda and in Naples, providing the origins of the town's municipal airports. On the outskirts of Fort Myers, one of the nation's first gunnery schools was set up by the Army Air Corps on 6,500 acres in Buckingham. Captain Oscar Corbin, who would later serve three terms as mayor of Fort Myers, trained gunners at the field, which graduated some 50,000 men. Well, before, the, before World War II, we did not have any, any gunnery program to defend our bombers at all. And so it, it's, it began with the beginning of World War II. And then uh, at the end of World War II, by that time, we had our remote control. And by that time, jet airplanes had came out. As one of what would evolve into seven other gunneries in the US, the Buckingham program was short-lived and unique. For a period during the war, the Central Instructor School was headquartered there despite the field's difficult terrain. The field was ugly. It was made out of tar paper buildings. It was hot and, and uh, the water would get knee deep. It, it was bad drainage, but the morale was high. And that all kind of stems back to the fact that Colonel Del, Delbert Smi Spivey was the CO and he, he really boosted morale. And we had the finest morale of any base I was served on during in, uh, World War II. Shooting at air-to-air -air targets over the Gulf, sometimes the men would become disoriented, coming back to the base after dark. Several planes went down in the dense Everglades, only to be discovered after the war. At the end of the war, Charlotte County Municipal Airport was established at the site of the airfield in Punta Gorda and Naples Municipal Airport came into being at the former auxiliary field there that served Buckingham Gunnery. Page Field and Fort Myers resumed private and commercial activity. The airways were on the rise with an astounding future in store. Moving through time, the Southwest Florida we know today came into existence around modes and routes of transportation. Early settlers arrived by schooners from other port cities such as Key West. Railroad lines brought in ambitious businessmen and upper-class tourists from the Northeast. Then the roadways opened up the area to the masses. The steamers and schooners, the iron horse, the horseless carriage, and the barnstormers and bombardiers, all are indelibly etched into Southwest Florida's history and heritage. Order a video of this program, call 1 888 824 0030 or visit our website at wgcu.org and please refer to the program number on your screen. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Visit our website at wgcu.org or call the number on your screen.